So I just want to welcome everyone back to the second half of our workshop of the of our program for the day. Um, and if there are any newcomers, I welcome you as well. Just a reminder, this program is being recorded. So if you prefer not to be on screen, please turn your camera off at this time. Closed captioning is available by selecting the CC icon also located at the bottom of the screen. And as we move through the workshop, if you have a question, please put them in the chat. Or if you would like to engage directly with Jasmine, please use the raise hand function within the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen. In the coming weeks, we will be posting the full program recording for you to revisit or to watch from the start. With that, I'm so thrilled to share a little bit about our workshop facilitator, Jasmine Hayes, who will guide you through the rest of the day. Jasmine Hayes is an interdisciplinary artist born, raised, and based in Brooklyn, New York. Her multimedia practice explores race histories of the African diaspora and the ways that are preserved and reproduced through cultural traditions. Jasmine, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Dayan, for that introdu introduction. I also want to thank the Studio Museum and the entire panel. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and so first, um, what I want us to do, I'm going to introduce my artwork, my practice. Um, there were some similarities in uh, our practices, and so I'm excited to actually share. This is a series uh, I started some years ago called Bloodline, um, where I am studying the patterning of braids uh, using pen on paper. Um, and this started because uh, there's this fetishization that happens of Africa being Black American. Um, and like, longing for Africa, but not having um, connections to it. And so hair braiding for me is one of those connections. And so I started to study different patterns um, and I have a direct connection to hair braiding. Um, at a young age, I started braiding hair just to like make money. Uh, I used to love Alan Iverson. I still love Alan Iverson. <laughs> and I would watch his, um, the 76ers play and his mom would braid his hair um, at all of his games. And so, which was very controversial, um, but this was my form of making money at a young age, like starting at like age 12. I had started doing my own hair at a very, very young age. My mother would send me to school with one style. I'd come back with another. Um, which often didn't end well. <laughs> uh, but thinking about hair and um, the connections that we long for. And so I, I was looking at an art historical context of portraiture and also in relation to photography, but coming from a painting background, um, if you were commissioned to do a, have your portrait uh, painted, um, it often meant that you were of a particular class. And so you don't see many uh, much Black presence in paintings um, throughout art historical periods. And uh, that's kind of what the beauty of photography is. Um, it allowed our stories to live um, and not be erased. And so I was thinking of uh, portraiture in those ways and detaching the face and using hair as the identifier. Um, I've exhibited this, this was my last installation. I work across an, an array of mediums. So drawing, um, now tapestry work, um, mainly by hand. I haven't learned to use a, a textile mill yet, but mostly doing tapestries through hand and thinking of quilting. I also work in video, writing, and sound, as well as performance. So this installation was called To the Peaches, um, correlating from Nina Simone's Four Women with focus on the fourth woman peaches. And in this installation, I am using photographs of my younger self, my mother, and my sister, and thinking of the women in my life who are strong, but who have made me who I am today. Um, 
if I zoom in, it may be a little hard to see on your screen, uh, but I created this wallpaper pattern um, thinking of a particular comb that was found in my home, but often I find in other households of black women that I know. And it's a three-way comb where there's one side uh, that has uh, tighter tooth uh, teeth on, on the left side. And then the right side, there's like a medium size uh, width between the teeth and the bottom of the comb is a pick. So this comb is specifically for textured hair and to give you volume uh, to your hair. And so my mother used this comb often to do my hair um, because it was so versatile. It can handle if my hair was being straightened or pressed um, or if she had just washed my hair and needed to detangle my hair, this comb was used. Uh, and then, so these are the tapestry works that I am currently working on. Um, this was the piece that I saw some connections to um, and this is called These Hands Work. Um, and so I like to play with titles a bit. Um, so These Hands Work, I'm thinking about the craft uh, of um, and the labor of our hands, but also um, growing up like in East New York, Brooklyn, what's considered like the hood. These Hands Work could also mean like if someone mess with me, <laughs> these hands work and they can let you know what they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I like to play uh, with double entendres in my titles. Um, this is just a still image of a video installation. This is a single channel video installation in which um, I overlap imagery of, from Nina Simone's performance of Four Women in Holland in 1965 with popular references from Black culture like Boys in the Hood or um, popular references of black women, sorry, um, uh, from uh, like Boys in the Hood, uh, rap videos like Queen Latifah, looking at TLC, and just looking at like the culture of the 80s and 90s specifically, as well as the early 2000s and um, black women leading culture in those ways. Uh, the pots of water are a reference to the last step of hair braiding in which you dip the braids in this um, boiling hot water to set the braids. Not boiling, but because it is plastic hair, so it will melt. Um, I forgot to mention that these are made from Konekalon hair, uh, where women, I have women come to a studio and we braid in spaces together, share one another's energy. And I am using single braids as thread um, and uh, building a loom specifically to use uh, connecting on here as thread. And then this goes into performance work. Um, I think about black women holding space for one another and often these acts of survival um, permitting spaces of intimacy and care in ways that we may not receive it in other areas. Um, and I'm going to show two of these videos. This is from um, a performance done in Union Square called Solstice. Um, and the second performance is called High A. Um, and this was at my residency in Baltimore, Maryland. So I'm gonna share those two videos and then we're gonna go into meditation and writing prompts. Let me know if I'm going over time, Dan. I just wanna make sure I did not time myself. You're doing great. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, let's go to Devin. Okay, I'm trying. Like, as far as being a black woman, it's a metaphysical thing, you know that you can talk to one of your sisters and they'll understand you from the point of you and your experience as a black woman. So that's what gives me solace and all the things that uproot you and all the things that shift you or like encroach on your space. You still know that you have support in some way.
So um, this piece, when I created uh, this piece, um, it, was, it wasn't impulsive, I would say, but we had no rehearsal. And I asked uh, performers to meet me in Union Square with two packs of braiding hair. And basically one of us uh, starts the braid and then it continues around the circle until the circle grows. Um, this resulted in a, I believe the braid ended up being 42 feet. Um, and so thinking about uh, this being such an intimate space but doing this in public and what that means as a black woman's experience often, um, allowing, having to allow so much of ourselves to be in a public eye, um, moments that are very intimate for us. Um, and also just thinking of sisterhood and like the bonding that hair braiding permits to. Um, and so that lending to the conversation of how do we heal ourselves, like these different traumas that come from, um, that come across the, our waters and lands like that connect us. Uh, and so last year when I was in Baltimore for a residency, I was going through some personal things. And this is in the height of the pandemic still. And so I was thinking of healing, but how to still allow performance without um, sisterhood being around me. And so I created this piece Haye. So when I created this piece, I was thinking of elements of the earth, thinking of sound as, uh, just thinking of all the cultural traditions that bind us together, um, dealing with erased histories and the ways um, we preserve these histories. Um, I often wear white in my performances um, to honor my ancestors in the absence of um, those who have left us. Um, but thinking of sound and like the spirituality within sound, um, like chanting uh, our words, um, how our words are spells. Um, and so looking at all of these different cultural traditions, whether it's weaving or whether it's music or dance and how this is, uh, this allows our history to survive when writing is uh, not in place. And so today my intention for the workshop is to think of these spaces of survival that may come from uh, spaces of pain or trauma, but finding the beauty in those things and um, allowing care and intimacy. Uh, so what I want you to do, um, if you could find a comfortable spot, I'm gonna put on a little music and we're just gonna do a very quick breath work. All right, find a comfortable spot. And I want you to close your eyes. We're gonna do a simple four, four breathing where you inhale for four seconds and exhale for four seconds. Um, so if you can close your eyes. And we're gonna inhale, inhale, one, 
two, three, four, and release. One, two, three, four. Inhale. And release. 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 Inhale. Release. Inhale. Release. Inhale. Release. You want to take two last breaths. Inhale. Release. And one big inhale. And a last release. There you go. If you feel any tension in your shoulders, roll that out. Roll your neck a little bit. Just release any tension. Okay. Yes, I hope the breath work was helpful. Um, breath work is really important for me in my healing practice and also in my art practice. Um, when I'm working with uh, other women, sometimes um, we are sharing, uh, we're vulnerable in those spaces. And so I always acknowledge that we're existing in this space together. We're breathing in this space together. We are one in this space. I wanna thank you all for your presence before we go into the writing prompts for those who stayed on. Uh, if you could take two minutes, find a photograph, pay attention to the clothing, the hair, the surrounding. Um, think about what were the feelings of the people in the photograph? What type of day was it? What was the weather? What is the surrounding? What was the fabric worn? Does it look itchy? Does it look soft? Um, how was your hair prepped that day? Think of all these multiple like things and just break down this photograph. And then I want you to elaborate on the things forgotten or unremembered. So for this, I have a picture of my grandmother and my great grandmother, um, Levine, Grandma Viney, which I never met, but I am named after her. So it can be any photo of anyone. So I'm gonna read this poem that I wrote called The Kitchen. The Kitchen, the space where Grandma Viney dressed in all white cloth, a ritual, where her hands met with dough passing on traditions and recipes to my young grandmother and Aunt Pearl and Aunt Paulette. The space where everyone is not allowed, filled with spices washed from lost histories and cultures. The kitchen, 
the lower back edge of the hairline that meets the back of the neck, the area that isn't always caught in the braid or ponytail, a bit more textured, curly, tangled, coiled, the area that shows new growth first, both handled with care, both holding history passed down that cannot be erased. Um, and I wrote this piece thinking about, uh, I was showing at a gallery and someone, a black woman walked up to one of my pieces and she said, I love the way you capture our kitchens. And so thinking of nature, uh, like language, excuse me, um, and often there's only certain things that we may understand depending on your culture. And so like growing up with like Southern black uh, background, um, my mom, like this back, <laughs> back neck area, like it's called the kitchen, right? Like when she would press my hair, like it had to be handled with enough care so she wouldn't burn my neck, but it was like the most coiled area. And then when I started relaxing my hair, that area always showed my new growth first, right? Like it was always your edges that would frizz up. So thinking about our connection um, to these spaces and how there are often double entendres uh, to these words. Um, so for this writing prompt, um, this writing prompt, if you could take any material that you have on your list, it could be paper, it could be your own clothing, um, any type of fabric. And what I want you to do is um, close your eyes and feel the fabric uh, for just a bit of time. Think of its texture. Does it have a scent? How does it make you feel? Write three to five descriptive words and then write on its texture. I love seeing some of you like sniff the fabric and uh, <laughs> like I just, yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next part. <laughs> um, I'm gonna shift myself a little bit. It's easier for me to just work down here. And so today we are going to be doing a, uh, a hatching technique. It's used in weaving. Um, Hatching is also used in drawing, but that's not the hatching that I'm talking about today. And so I wanted to show you the hand, um, the braided, one of the braided pieces that uh, I've been working on. Um, so you could kind of see, it's a lot of over and under, which is used in like basket weaving, it's used in like threading, oftentimes used on a uh, loom as well. Right, and so it causes structure to happen. Like while I'm making, thank you everyone. Um, while I'm making uh, these tapestries, sometimes I need a little more structure because I'm using the braids as thread. Um, and it's just like if you're knitting or crocheting, um, there's a lot of over and under that causes uh, the structure of a blanket or a fabric or cloth, right? So we can do this with multiple materials. So I don't know what materials you have. If you don't have all the materials and you wanna just watch, that's also fine. I'm gonna start with paper for you. It's like a really ugly like arts and craft type of vibe. <laughs> but that's why I love it because it's like, I could teach this to a, maybe, maybe not a five-year-old. They might get uh, frustrated <laughs> with it, but I can teach this to children essentially. And as you can see back here, I have like a smaller loom. So I've built these looms. I have one that's much larger for like really large tapestries that I do. Um, but people come in, we do a bunch of braids. I like to uh, do the braids by hand versus buying them pre-packed. Um, I just think it looks better. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's done by a machine, like you could really feel the hand more. Um, so typically on the loom, you normally have like a top and a bottom. For this, I have to have all sides because it is hair braids, it's not a continual thread. So we're kind of using that same technique today. Um, and let's see. So I want you to take, 
if you have tape, also speak up if I'm going too fast. I get a little excited. But if you have tape, I want you to take, um, if you have strips of paper, you can cut up paper uh, into strips like this. Let's see. So if you have paper, if you have string or straw, you're already set. I see you, yes, rip that paper. <laughs> you can rip it, you can cut it, whatever you wanna do. You can take five minutes to do that, right? But I wanna just show you first, once you get those strips already cut, if I could find the seam for this tape, here we go. So since we don't have a frame, the tape is kind of gonna be the frame. If you're skilled with your hands and you could somehow do a over and under without the tape, uh, bless you. I don't think I'm that skilled. <laughs> but if you have some tape, it could be scotch tape, whatever type of tape. What you wanna do is you wanna start taking just strips of either string or your paper, if you have fabric, um, you can maybe cut the fabric if you want. That might be more time consuming, but you can use fabric or twine, et cetera. And I don't know if you can see this. Let me do it with blue tape so you can see it better. I'm just taking a small piece. You can lay this on a table. I just need to be able to show you how to do it so I'm not laying it on the floor to do it. And you're gonna place the strips on the tape. You wanna leave some of the top because we're gonna fold that over. All right, I'm just gonna do like three. Or four or five. <laughs> Okay, so you have it like that. And then you're gonna take the top part of the tape and fold it over. Okay. You're gonna take another piece of tape. And if you have some like leftover, You're gonna stick it to it, right? So it looks kind of like this. You don't have to do this with me right now. You could just watch it first, but unless it helps you do it right now. Um, and you see you have like the sticky side. You're gonna do the same thing and just start adding paper, but going horizontally or against the other direction of the paper. All right. So it's not the neatest, but you kind of see it kind of like got like these flaps going. If you have string, you can cut the string. Like if it's just long like twine, you could probably cut it into, I would say like pieces that are like less than a foot. You don't want it too long. Um, and then it's a over and under process. So you'll take one strip, I don't know if you guys ever uh, used to, or not you guys, if you all used to, um, you know, lanyards, like they were like, you would put them on your keychains. There was one pattern called the box um, or sometimes like the Chinese staircase, but you would take it, you would take your one string and then you would go over and then under the other. I don't know if you could see that clearly. You see, so it starts to do it over and under and you just keep doing the over and under. I'm like, did you finish yours? <laughs> I'm like watching you all do it. If you could lay it flat on a table, that helps too. <laughs> it looked like some of you finished. I was like, wow, like impressive, excuse me. <laughs> um, and then, so for the next row, so everything kind of works in rows. 
because this one is over, you're gonna go under instead for your next row. That's, you'll start under. And then you'll go through and pull over. So if you don't need my guidance any longer, <laughs> feel free to make whatever you want. Like for this one I have here, I'm thinking about adding like twine to it or some type of string uh, to add color. I may just actually work on this instead. <laughs> um, but since you all have paper, <laughs> you don't have pre-braided hair, that's pretty much how you do this. But play around with it. Use string, add whatever you want into it. Um, and I just want to see what we make in the end the right sentiment to you know wrap up what has been a really wonderful and inspiring and really joy-filled day um jasmine thank you so much for gracing us with your your immense talent and warmth and heart and spirit um so needed um and i just thank all of you for sticking it out with us for what has been truly a really wonderful way of spending a Saturday. I thank all of you again. And we're gonna put a brief survey in the chat box if you could fill that out, just to give us feedback about how this program went. Would you like to see more of? Uh, we'd immensely appreciate it. And um, as we mentioned, we will be posting this recording on the event page in the coming weeks. So if you do wanna revisit this day, you can. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend and please stay in touch and stay well.